Well, I was born in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, and I immigrated here when I was a youngster. I uh, grew up in Baltimore, and I now live in Prince George's County. I was going to be the costume designer in theater. That was originally what I wanted to do, because my mom was an excellent seamstress, and she taught me how to sew. And I fell in love with theater when I was younger and thought, uh, what an interesting way to combine the two passions. The squadron I enlisted to when I joined in 1979, and there were three women. I was one of the three, and a handful of, of blacks in the whole squadron. And I look back at that picture today, and I think of what it would look like now, if we took the same picture and it would be totally different. It was an interesting time. Back in 1979, women were still new to the Maryland Air National Guard. Uh, so there was this dichotomy of how you were treated. In one way, I was 18 years old. I was pretty naive. And there were big brothers, and then there were not so big brothers. So there was the idea of people were protecting you. They could say certain things to you, but others could not. So it was a really different, kind of weird tension back in those days. And um, being one of a few women in an organization certainly does have its share of challenges. There is certainly much more connection across the, the spectrum of race today than it was, say, when I first even moved here or joined the, the military. Being a person, a woman and a person of color in a situation where there aren't many women or people of color, one would naturally think there were some other women or people of color that were my mentors. But primarily, they were people not of color and they were males because that's the environment in which I existed. So as I tell people about mentoring, it's not about someone that looks like you is the mentor you need to have or should have, not that you shouldn't have people that look like you, but it's the people that are in positions that know something that need to share it with you. So when I look at mentoring people, if I just looked at people that look like me to mentor, I wouldn't have too many people to mentor. But your responsibility is to mentor across the spectrum. And if I've learned nothing else from the fact that the majority of people that chose to share their insight, wisdom, and honesty, and, and critical feedback to me looked nothing like me. They were white males. But they knew what needed to be done. They knew the expectations and responsibilities that one needed to have. And they chose to share that with me. So I think that's a perspective I take in terms of mentoring. It's not just about mentoring those that look like me. It's about mentoring each and every person in the organization. This is a time in our lives in this country where the opportunity is limitless to me for you black women. And I tell our young girls, I said, you can do whatever you want to do if you want to do it. So they will be able to write their own ticket. And it's interesting because I think back, you know, 30 years ago, I necessarily wasn't able to write my own ticket. But now I really believe that these young girls can write their own tickets if that's what they choose to do. Having been enlisted for seven years prior and going through basic training, Officer training was nothing compared to that. But it also is the foundation of every decision I make today because I think about Airman Basic, Allison Solomon, when I make decisions. Because at the end of the day, that impacts Airman Basic, whoever, you know? And I remember how naive and unaware of the big picture I was back then. And that's a lot of our folks today because they're not necessarily in those positions to be aware of that. I didn't necessarily see myself sitting here. I was going to get out after three years. It, it wasn't fitting into my future because I saw other things that I wanted to do. And I remember one of the civilians that worked with us said, honey, you're just starting to make some money. <laughs> I think it was $25, $35 or whatever it was for a drill weekend. It was an E3 or something like that. I was finally getting enough money to pay for gas to go to school. But so that got me got me the first six years. And then once you got to 10, I'm like, okay, 
If I, I was smart enough to know, if I could get to 20, I'd get a retirement. <laughs> so initially those were the incentives, but I will tell you that's not what kept me in ultimately because there were some days I remember I would go and I'd cry to my mother and I'd say, why are these people treating me like this? You know, I'm just trying to do my job. And it was hard and I wanted to quit. I said, they don't deserve me. I need to go someplace. And my mother said, you need to be there. You need to stick it out. So in many times, even to this day, I blame her for making me stick it out um, because there were many days I just said, I want to say, I, I don't need you. I don't, I don't need to be treated that way. And I'm going to go find some place that values me more. But somehow I managed to stick it out in spite of it. Well, I was at an event and one of the people was surprised to hear that I was not a pilot. I said, that's on top of everything else. I said, if everything else wasn't bad enough, so some people would say, then she's not a pilot and she's in charge of the Air National Guard. I think one of the things I've learned as I've gone up in the organization, you get further and further away from technical skills and being technically qualified to do anything. And you get more and more tasks to lead, manage an organization.